most of the time now, or a good portion of the time. We live out in Mesa, Power Road and 202, more or less, uh, the north part of 202. I guess I should say it Arizona way, the 202. It is uh, wonderful to be here. Alliance Defending Freedom has been supportive of homeschooling uh, from its launching uh, 24 years ago. HSLDA, of course, like AFI, is celebrating its 35th anniversary. But HSLDA and Alliance Defending Freedom have worked together principally on international religious freedom because ADF has offices in Strasbourg, Virginia. In Strasbourg, Virginia. There is a Strasbourg, Virginia. In, in Strasbourg, France, and also in Geneva, where many of the homeschooling issues have come up. We have a case now that we're working together, the two organizations, for the right of German families to be able to homeschool. They've been prosecuted and persecuted in that country. So there's a real continuum of what I've been doing for a long, long time in coming to uh, ADF. And I just want to say a brief word about what ADF has got going on right now in Arizona. Today, there is a case going on. In fact, it may be winding up right this minute. The Arizona Court of Appeals is dealing with a case involving two uh, artists who have a studio called Brush and Nib. They do all kinds of invitations. They're a calligrapher and an artist that uh, paint and create beautiful invitations, wedding invitations, all kinds of things. And under a local law, if they refuse to participate and refuse to use their artistic talent to create invitations for same-sex weddings, they're subject to extremely high fines. And ultimately, the real point of it is to shut their business down. And if we don't have the freedom to decide how we're going to use our own speech, how we're going to use our own artistic talent, we don't really live in a free country in them anymore. And we need to make sure that this, uh, these two young women that have this studio prevail here in Arizona. Of course, that may sound a lot like the case that's pending before the Supreme Court of the United States right now, because it is very similar. Jack Phillips is the owner and manager, and also, by the way, a homeschooling dad who runs the, the bake shop in Lakewood, Colorado. Alliance Defending Freedom is Jack's lawyer. Uh, my colleague, Kristen Wagner, argued the case in the Supreme Court of the United States in December. We're waiting for the decision. I obviously helped Kristen get ready for the oral argument, and she uh, did a terrific job. I believe, based on being there and listening to the justices' questions, that we are in a very good position to win. Can't guarantee that, obviously, until the court releases its decision but I believe that we will see some sort of a victory out of that. And if we do, then I think it will help cases like the Brush and Nib case that's going on right now today here in Phoenix. We uh, also have a case that's pending in the Supreme Court uh, involving our nearby state of California, where California decided it was going to try to stop pro-life pregnancy centers from being able to get out the word to women that life is a wonderful choice and that no matter what circumstances they find themselves in, there is a realistic and loving way that they can choose life rather than to choose abortion. And there are two, uh, two kinds of, of, of uh, facilities in California that serve pregnant women in this way. There are fully licensed medical clinics that are pro-life, and then there are unlicensed non-medical clinics that, that give all kinds of practical help, like diapers and childbirth classes and counseling and cribs and whatever the women need, they make sure that they get the practical loving help that they need that to, to know that life is a wonderful choice. Well, when California decided to shut those down, they enacted free speech rules, or actually violations of free speech rules, that are very clear. The pro-life medical clinics were required to put on their walls a sign that says essentially this. If you'd like a free abortion from the state of, paid for by the state of California, call this phone number. That's, that's a little bit truncated, but that's essentially what it said in about 29 words. And for the non-medical facilities, they had to put on their advertising this huge disclaimer in multiple languages. 29 words that effectively say we're not a medical facility, said in 29 words rather than four, and said in 13 languages rather than one, whatever the ad was in, and the font size had to be larger than the ad itself, or else the same size as the ad with special colors. 
The purpose was not to communicate any information. The purpose was to make advertising so expensive that they couldn't advertise and to drown out the message. That's what's going on. And we called upon one of our, well, actually we called on me to argue that case in the Supreme Court of the United States. And so I argued that case on March 20th. And we also think that case went very well. Uh, the reporters uh, for the major national publications that routinely cover the Supreme Court of the United States all basically said California had a bad day in the Supreme Court. Uh, the best indication was when I got done with the argument, the judges walked off the bench and I turned around to the courtroom. Everybody that I knew was beaming and everybody that was on California's side seemed very dejected. So that, uh, that was a really good moment. So, uh, but we again don't know until the Supreme Court act uh, actually issues its ruling. But these are aspects of freedom. And if we don't stand up for freedom in this country, we're not going to be a free country. There is a, there's a sense that's going on in this country of people not being willing to let people with whom they disagree be free anymore. When we're using banks to shut down people who don't agree with the political correctness, when we're using insurance companies to shut down companies that they don't agree with. Our own insurance at ADF was shut down briefly by one of the major insurance companies, and they sent us a letter that said, it's because of your view on social issues. So you're going to see more and more economic pressure. You're going to see more and more uh, attempts to shut down those with whom we, we uh, that disagree with us, but we not should not be the kind of people that return the favor. We should say the traditional American freedom mantra is this. I don't agree with anything you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That's what free Americans say. Now, homeschool freedom means basically this. All freedom is, is, is actually pretty simple. I'm going to explain fairly complex constitutional concepts in a way that even a Democrat congressman from Massachusetts could understand. And so, uh, but, but homeschool kids, you'll get this easily. Freedom means the ability to you make the decision rather than government make the decision. Where should your kids go to school? Who makes the decision? A free parent, a free parent decides, I'll make the decision where my child goes to school. If they choose the public school, okay. They were free to make that decision. If they choose a charter school or a private school, they were free. And we're free when we're free as homeschool parents to make the decision to homeschool our kids. That's what freedom is about, the ability to make your own decisions. If you want to make your own decision about who you serve in your business, that's freedom. If you want to make the decision about many things. By the way, I will have to congratulate Arizona of having godly, wonderful highways. You guys drive at a really good rate around here. I like it. And so freedom is simply making your own decisions. Now, a republic is a government that free people can live under. Why? Because government is limited under a constitutional republic. And it's limited in lots of different ways that are very practical and very important. Now, you just heard directly from the leader of your state senate. You know how difficult it is to get Mitch McConnell the leader of the U.S. Senate to come to a meeting like this? It's not difficult. It's impossible. It's difficult to get your own U.S. Senators to come to a meeting. Not impossible, but it's difficult to get access to your members of Congress. Why? Well, they're off in Washington, D.C. They got lots of people they serve, and they got lots of money in the political process. There's lots of reasons it's difficult. And the reason that federalism is so important is that the more decisions made at the state level than at the federal level, the more access the people have to the people who are actually making the decisions. The more you make decisions in Washington, D.C., the less access the people have to those who make the decisions. You have legitimate, easy access to members of your state legislature. You have legitimate, easy access to your city councilman, and so on. The more localized the decision, the more the people can watch over what's going on and the people can be involved. And that's what the ultimate objective is. And that's why obeying the Constitution's limits on what the federal government is supposed to be doing is so important. It's not merely that they spend us into oblivion, although they do that too. It's really if they start enacting laws on everything, it's impossible for the people to control what they're doing. 
And a limited government is the government of free people. An unlimited government is a government who's governing people who are subjects, not free citizens. And we do not want to go in the direction of being subjects. We want to be free citizens and be able to watch the government that's, that's governing us. Now, you've been told, young people here today, that you can get involved in politics. Now, how many of you here that are under 18 would like to vote in the next election, despite the fact that you're not 18? Okay? How many of you would like to pretend that you're from Chicago and you want to vote a lot of times? Okay? Okay. Now, I can tell every one of you how you can vote really as many times as you want, but let's just take 10 times. Everybody here want to vote 10 times in the next election? Okay, here's how you can vote 10 times. Legally, in your church, on average, half the people there are not registered to vote. And I don't mean the kids, I mean the people that are over 18 years old. Half of them are not registered to vote. You should just go around to people at church with a little list and say to them, I'm doing a survey about whether people are registered to vote. Are you registered to vote? And if they say no, you can get local information on how to get them registered. And you can go back to them every Sunday until they get registered to vote. Now, once they're registered to vote, it doesn't mean they know who to vote for. You gotta tell them. Okay, here's how you tell them. You get Kathy Harrod's voter's guide from American, from Arizona Family Association, and I didn't say her organization exactly right. Arizona Family Policy Council. Did I get Okay, Center for Arizona Families. Policy. <laughs> Kathy Harrod's organization, like I said in the first place. Okay, you get her voter's guide. It doesn't tell you how to vote. It just tells you how people stand on the issues. And you are smart enough that you can figure out how to vote based on what you agree with and what you disagree with. So you read the voter's guide and you figure out who's worth supporting. And then you go back to the people that you registered to vote and you tell them, I want you to vote for this person and that person and the other person. And when you figure that out, then on a, when it comes to election time, about three days before the election, you pick up the phone for everybody you registered to vote. And you say, look, at election day's coming. I want you to go vote. Remember to vote for this person and this person and this person. And then on election morning, you call them and say, remember today's the day to go vote. And at noon, you call them back and say, have you voted yet? And at four o'clock, you call them back and you say, have you voted yet? And until they say, yes, I went and voted, you don't leave them alone. If you do that, every person here can vote 10 times. All the kids can vote 10 times. So if you want to change the outcome of the election, there are enough people here today, and there are clearly enough people in your convention this summer who can change the outcome of any election in Arizona if you'll do just that. And it's, it's lawful, it's godly, it's appropriate, and it increased citizenship participation at every level. You can easily change how this works. Now, I just want to end by talking about homeschooling for a minute. Now, our family used to homeschool. We, we tried it for a while and then we quit. Well, actually, we've homeschooled for 33 years and our last one went to college, so we didn't have anybody left to homeschool. My wife tried to homeschool me and I resisted. And so, 33 years we homeschooled our 10 kids. Now we have 21 grandkids, and all of them have been or are being homeschooled. I have two are college age now. It's really difficult for me to say that I have grandchildren who are in college. Um, the official, by the way, parents and, you know, and grandparents, you officially become old when you say these words. I went to my grandchild's high school basketball game. I had to say that about five years ago and I officially became old. Uh, but the freedom that we experienced for our family, and the, the freedom that you all experience here will last as long as we make it last. There are people who do not want you to homeschool and they are very powerful. There are a series of law review articles that have been written by women and some men, but mostly women, uh, it just so happens, Kimberly Urocco from Northwestern University Law School, one of the top 20 law schools in the country. Catherine Ross from George Washington Law School, another top law school. Martha Albertson Finneman from Emory Law School. And then there's this one guy off at Stanford, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, although I've met him at a conference over in Scottsdale recently. 
they write basically this. Because you teach your children values that are contrary to what they believe is essential for a country, you should lose your right to teach. Not because you're not teaching them adequately math, reading, science, and so on, but because you're teaching the wrong philosophy. And the, uh, although they object to lots of different aspects of philosophy, they don't like what we teach about marriage. They don't like what we teach about families. They don't like what we teach about uh, abortion. They don't like what we teach about a lot of things. But ultimately, it's this. They don't like what we teach about Jesus. That's really what it's all about. And the American Bar Association itself said that we should adopt the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. They published a book on that. And the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child says, according to the ABA, that a, a, a school or a church that teaches children that Jesus is the only way to God are in violation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child norm on tolerance. By the way, I want to encourage all of you to reject tolerance. Now, that sounds audacious, but here's why. Tolerance is a cheap imitation of two really good things. Tolerance in the sense that I'm going to uh, allow somebody who differs from me to exist and have freedom. That's Tolerance is, I don't really like you, but I'm going to put up with you. Christians are taught much better than that. We're not to tolerate people who we disagree with. We're to love people who we disagree with. We're not to just merely, you know, put up with them and kind of keep them over in a corner. We're supposed to invite them over for dinner. We're supposed to serve them and love them. We're supposed to stand for their freedom, just like we stand for our freedom. Tolerance is a cheap imitation of love, and it's a cheap imitation of freedom. Freedom means that everybody gets to say what they want, and the government has no jurisdiction over our minds, our hearts, our souls. That's freedom. Tolerance is you can say whatever you want as long as you don't differ from us too much. We do not want those cheap imitations. We want love. We want freedom. We don't want the cheap imitation that they're calling tolerance these days. We are called to a higher standard. And as homeschoolers, we want freedom for ourselves. Why? Cool. Actually, warm. Uh, that is really cool. That's a real celebration of freedom going on right there. When red, white, and blue balloons start popping, that is outstanding. We want freedom because it allows us to worship Jesus. Jesus being the only way to God is not, as the ABA said, intolerant. It is God telling us the truth, that that is the only way to God. All other ways to God, they're going to end you up in a bad place. You don't want to follow that because it's not the truth. The truth is we need to be able to with gentle persuasion and kindness, present truth to people. But because we believe in freedom, we leave it to them to decide whether they join in the truth or whether they continue to be confused or whether they deliberately choose to follow a lie. And so we need to be people of freedom and people of truth. If that is the heart of your homeschool, and I believe that it is, it's inherent in the nature of homeschooling that you're teaching freedom, that you're teaching truth. And it, it, because of that, I believe that we are raising up the next generation of leaders because inside of every person in this country, no matter how confused they get along the way, there's a heart that yearns for freedom. People want to make their own decisions. They'd rather make their own decisions locally rather than have them made at a distance. People get the basic things and it's all in their heart. And the people who understand these things, who can articulate these things, who can do as this young girl did this uh, this morning, not only recite the Declaration of Independence, I'm confident she can explain the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. The people who can explain freedom in a simple, winsome, understandable way are going to be the leaders of the next generation. That's why we see homeschoolers who are entering that field to be leaders in so many ways just one little aspect of it i'll brag on patrick henry college for just a minute for obvious reasons patrick henry college has won 11 national championships in moot court that's legal debate we've won world one world national cha uh, cha world championship in moot court 
beating law schools. The only other American school that qualified for the world championship was Yale Law School. You had Patrick Henry undergraduate and Yale. Yale did pretty well, but we won the world championship with a couple of homeschool kids that were sophomores in college. The reason that you see that kind of outsized effectiveness is because families like yours have taught their kids to love freedom and explain freedom. And as long as we love freedom and we explain freedom and embrace it, not just because it's rope, but because we genuinely strive to understand we will be the vanguard when a people hungry for freedom get tired of the repression of political correctness, get tired of the repression of big government. Your kids, my kids, my grandkids will be the people that will stand up and lead this nation to its freest days. I have long believed that America's greatest days are yet ahead. And I believe that I'm looking at the reason that that is so very true. God bless you. Thank you very much.